We should have already banned chokeholds. We should have already banned shooting the moving vehicles. We should have already required officers to intervene if they know their partner's engaged in wrongdoing, but we hadn't done that before either. So we need to do all these things at the same time, and we know that the will is there to do it. We just need courageous city leaders and governors. Hello and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for the Washington Post. This afternoon, we have a very special conversation in partnership with the Council on Criminal Justice, a think tank working to advance understanding and build consensus around criminal justice policy choices facing the nation. I wanna welcome the, the member of CCJ's Board of Trustees who are with us, but I also would like to welcome our two guests who you see on the screen, co-founder of Campaign Zero and Black Lives Matter activist DeRay McKesson and Charles Ramsey, the former police chief of Washington, D.C. and of Philadelphia, who was also chair, co-chair of President Obama's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. Uh, thank you both so much for being here today. Thank you. Good to be here. Okay, so, so we have to get some, some definitions out of the way. There's a phrase that everyone is talking about right now. It, the phrase is defund the police. And depending on who you talk to, the definition changes. So what I would like for, and I'm gonna start with you, DeRay, what does that mean from the viewpoint of Campaign Zero, defund the police? Yeah, so I think that when we zoom out, we're reminded that the police have killed more people since 2014, not less. Uh, our data doesn't go back much further than 2013 when we think about this issue because the federal government has never collected data. I think there are two big buckets. One is like, how do we reduce the power of the police immediately? And then how do we shrink the role of the police? Now, the defund language is, is hard for some people, but it really is this idea of like move the money to follow the responsibilities. And it's actually an idea that everybody I've ever talked to about it, they already agree, that experts should do what experts do. That who should be dealing with the mental health crisis? Probably an expert. Probably not a police officer. Who should respond to somebody with suicidal ideation? Probably a mental health expert. Probably not an officer. Who should respond to homelessness? Probably a social worker, not an officer. The police are the first people to tell us that they're not social workers, and we agree. So we should actually permanently remove those responsibilities and permanently remove those resources. And that's what this idea gets to. It gets to the idea that experts should do what experts do. Um, I, I, DeRay, could you say that phrasing again? I want to make sure I got it right. Move the money to where the responsibilities are. Is that correct? Yeah, so like you shift the responsibilities right. and then you shift the resources. Uh, Chief Ramsey, what does defund the police mean to you? And, and respond to uh, DeRay's characterization of what defund the, defund the police uh, means to him. Well, I, I don't disagree with what DeRay is saying in terms of, uh, of uh, where the money should go. I think it's a poor choice of words, though. I think the, when you use a term like defund, and that in itself can be confusing to people, that begs for more clarity. If you want to reallocate funds or whatever you want to call it, I think we need to start discussing it in that way. And personally, I don't have a problem with reallocating funds to community-based social services, for an example. I mean, substance abuse counselors need to be responding to calls like that, mental health professionals. Police have over the years been asked to do too much. The question is, when should that occur? Because they're not gonna be able to have the staffing to respond to a call at two, three o'clock in the morning right away. So we should look at this thing and look at it in a way in which it can be implemented without a gap in services uh, as a result of the transfer or reallocation of uh, funding. But I don't fundamentally disagree with the idea of having the social services with the expertise do what they're paid to do, uh, and that is respond to these various uh, situations. Now, that sounds great um, 
on paper. It sounds great when it when it comes out of both of your your mouths. But in order for it to happen, you have to get lo you have to get local governments to right. go along to go along with this. So how do you convince local governments that to do what you're talking about is not a scary thing. It's not an unknown thing. It is something that you could actually do and you could do it well if you take the time to, to uh, structure it. Yeah, well, I think, I, I can, go ahead. Go, go ahead, ahead Ray. Ray. I think what's going to be interesting, and, and Ramsey, you know this, is that we have not yet really hit the next budget cycle. So like, we're not in the next fiscal year yet. And the next fiscal year is going to be wild for everybody, for every school system, for every city, for every agency. So this conversation about funding is just going to be like, we are going to be in a place where we are moving a whole lot of money really quickly. So we, you know, when I think about how this will play out in practice, it will play out with overtime for police. I think it'll play out making sure that we are not spending uh, extra money or more money on a whole lot of police services. You know, there are some states that, like, I think Massachusetts pays police to uh, to sort of monitor construction sites. Like, I think there's going to be a host of things that just fall by the wayside. I'm actually worried about what's going to happen to public education, how many teachers are going to get laid off. Like, I think that cities are going to have to make a lot of decisions. And I think the spirit of this is that we don't need to dump money into the police, which is historically what people do. That public safety is actually a function of all the other things. And there, you know, when we look at arrests, it's only 5% of the arrests in the country happen for violent crime. It's a pretty small, uh, small percentage of the overall pie. Chief Ramsey? Well, you know, I mean, DeRay ra raises uh, uh, some, some good issues, but there is going to be a, a situation, it started now already, but certainly next fiscal year, it's going to be very tight. COVID shutting down everything, uh, it, it is going to really be a strain, which concerns me because I've been in government a long time and cities have a, a way of going through budgets, not just police, but every budget, and filling gaps elsewhere. Just to know that that money will actually be channeled in the way in which we're talking is debatable because there are going to be a lot of holes and a lot of gaps. And so uh, how you get them to do it uh, and have the increase in services that are going to be necessary and also take into consideration the fact that some of these calls, whether it's a person going through mental health crisis or domestic violence, I heard mentioned, uh, which is one of the most dangerous calls a police officer can go to. A lot of these uh, professionals are going to still want backup by police. And just to clarify one thing, when you've got situations where, like you mentioned, Massachusetts and construction sites, those are what we call reimbursable details. Those are people who are off, but it's paid for by the company. It doesn't come out of the uh, operating budget of the, uh, of the city. You know, DeRay, you raise a very good point in terms of, of the budgets. And because of the economic collapse as a result of COVID-19, Local localities are going to be basically robbing Peter to pay Paul, um, you might think. But what, as you were speaking, and Chief Ramsey, you can talk to this too, I kept thinking about police union contracts, police contracts. What could be, are they, are they um, weights around the, the ankles of local governments that are going to have to, going to have to pay these, fill these budget holes but because of, and I'm specifically thinking of police contracts, union contracts, that they might not be able to go for the reforms that we're talking about here. Chief Ramsey, you go first, and then DeRay. Well, you know, uh, union contracts can be the biggest obstacle to change there is. I'm not anti-union, but I do think they become far too powerful in a, in a lot of different ways. Not just in terms of funding and, you know, double time and a half for this or that or what, 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 whatever. When it comes to getting rid of bad police officers, it's very, very difficult. I mean, we've been focusing on the criminal behavior that took place in Minneapolis, but the majority of misconduct that we deal with it doesn't rise to a criminal level necessarily, but it's very difficult to discipline and get rid of a police officer. And when you look at a situation, and let's look at Chauvin for an example, where the city has 17 prior complaints, you know, well, that's like you, sometimes you arrest people and they've got 20, uh, 15 or 20 prior arrests as well. I mean, you know, w when you have people that consistently uh, engage in misconduct, whether they're sworn or civilian, I mean, it, it, to me, it's an indication the system is broken. And I would argue that the system of discipline and policing is broken. There's no question about it. There are too many cops that are on the job that should not be on the job. And that is part of the problem, no question about it. 
Chief Ramsey, let me just ask you a follow-up on that. Is that something, getting um, bad cops off the force, is that something that could be legislated um, at the federal level, or is that something that has to be done through union co union contracts, yeah. all that, those union that, contracts around the country? Yeah, those are terms and conditions of employment are negotiated at the local level. The federal government can do a few things, nothing around that. Uh, they're not going to be able to make much of a difference. And I'm not, again, anti-union or saying there shouldn't be due process for officers. But what I'm saying is I've had a couple cases that come to mind very quickly where I've fired an officer more than once. I fired him for one offense. It went to arbitration, which is another system that needs revamping and needs to be light, needs to be shown on that. Got the job back, com created, a, a committed another uh, offense worthy of firing, fired him again, went back to arbitration. But, you know, by the grace of God, this time it, it stuck. But I mean, you shouldn't have to go through that to get rid of a bad officer. And it taints the entire department. The few do define the many, unfortunately. So we've got to deal with folks that... Uh, are just not suited for the job. DeRay, let's talk about the legislation that was introduced uh, in the House earlier this earlier this week. Uh, actually, on Monday, House Democrats announced the Justice and Policing Act. And among the reforms are banning chokeholds, uh, no no-knock warrants, uh, and creating a national registry to track police misconduct, as uh, Chief Ramsey was just talking about. Does this do enough? Uh, definitely doesn't do enough. Is this an interesting start? Absolutely, right? But it definitely doesn't go far enough. The ban on Choco, you know, we offer, when we, when we launched 8 Can't Wait, we were saying that there are these eight uh, things that should be in use of force policies across the country. Banning chokeholds is one of them. You know, most people don't know the difference between a chokehold and a stranglehold. Uh, a chokehold is your air pipe. A, a stranglehold is the muscles around your neck. Uh, we want to ban on all neck restraints. So that is actually a really important thing. Collecting the data is interesting. Uh, we need to make sure that this is going to be a collection of all police violence and not simply police violence that results in death, because frankly, the activist community has done a much better job of already collecting that. Uh, and we also have to make sure that if uh, departments don't comply, that there's going to be some sort of accountability. And right now, the federal government has been unwilling to do anything that makes them accountable. So we think about, like, what does it mean uh, that police departments don't comply with the, they don't comply with the current uh, legislation around reporting because they know that if they if they don't send in the numbers and they're not going to lose money, there's no penalty, and that that actually doesn't make sense. So uh, this is an interesting first step. I think that it will do definite good, uh, but we could be much uh, could be much bolder. Well, Duray, I'm glad you brought up chokeholds and 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 other similar use of of force reforms. Because there's some folks in the community who say, you know, these things have been implemented, but there's been little change to police beha to police behavior. Um, will will these things work, or are they just for show and feel good? Jonathan, I'm not going to lie to you. It is. I, I was just saying to somebody today. I feel like I live in the twilight zone about this issue around use of force. And Ramsey, you um, you also know this well because. Some of the earliest research about use of force actually comes out of the Philadelphia Police Department in the 80s. Uh, so there is there is 40 years of research that supports the conclusion that more restrictive use of force leads to less killings in cities. It started in 1974 was the first study. Fife did a big study. Philadelphia was a huge case in uh, like a huge case study because the use of force restrictions got removed, then they got replaced. Police violence decreased dramatically. So, like, we know these rules matter. I think that what's happening in this moment is that there are a small set of researchers who deal with the police, who deal with policing. There's a huge set of researchers who deal with mass incarceration. They deal with prisons and jails. And I think that those people suddenly have appointed themselves experts on the police work, and they simply don't know what they're talking about. Like, I, it is true. It's been a fascinating sort of thing to watch people say that these rules don't matter. Uh, and, you know, what's been interesting, Jonathan, is that one of the critiques I've heard, they'll be like, but DeRay, you know, big cities have all these rules already. And you're like, they don't, right? So only 28 of the 100 big cities in the country even ban chokeholds and less than that ban strangleholds. New York City doesn't have an outright ban on chokeholds today. You know, they're not even half the cities ban shooting into moving vehicles. You know, it's like there is a mythology about these rules because they, they are so simple. They seem so simple to understand, but they are common sense, not commonplace.
you know, Deray, you've been talking about your your eight can't wait uh, your eight can't wait plan before eight police reforms that that claim to reduce police killings by as much as seventy two percent. There's been some pushback on the data you've used to back up these claims. What's your response? And also to point out that Brittany Packnett Cunningham, who was on one of the co-founders, one of your, your used to be on your board, announced yesterday that she resigned from your board, citing quote questions about the data analysis specifically. Can you address that? Yeah, so remember that we put the study out in 2016. People saw it; uh, they loved it. You know what we said then and what we say today is one of the hard things is sort of a macro level to understand is that they, the earliest data sets we have about police violence start at 2013. So one of the things people were frustrated by was like, there's not enough data here. And we were like, we totally get it. We used every piece of, every avail, piece of available data that we had, which was 2013, 14, 15. And you know, people were frustrated by the limited scope. So we hear that. Uh, we are excited to rerun the numbers. We actually had a team of researchers uh, rerun the numbers two days ago, and they said our conclusion is sound, and we feel confident in that. But here's a thing, Jonathan, even if you just erased our whole study, right? Even if we were like, you know, we don't stand by this, and I do stand by this study. Even if so, there's 40 years of research that leads to the same conclusion we got to, that more restrictive use of force leads to less killings. We weren't the first people to introduce this idea. We used more recent data than all of them, but the conclusion is the same. So I am frankly as confused as you or other people about why people sort of keep coming back to this, especially when we know, and Ramsey knows this, if the police thought these wouldn't matter, they wouldn't be fighting us on them. And I'm dealing all day with, with city council people and mayors calling me because the police unions are ready to kill them because they don't want any restrictions on use of force. They keep saying that like, if they have any restrictions that their lives are gonna be at risk or that crime's gonna go out of control or that it's gonna hamstring them. You know, I saw one police chief go on the news and say, if we have a use of force continuum, uh, then that means that if somebody comes around the corner and shoots at my officer, he has to remember. And you're like, you are fear mongering, right? So I'm confused about people sort of challenged with the data. Well, we've made the research basis very clear. Uh, people can recreate it. We've had one team already do it in the past couple of days, uh, but there's a, a 40 years of research that confirms our finding. Um, Chief Ramsey, if you could implement three specific policy prescriptions regarding the use of force, what would they be? Well, many of them are already in place. And I do agree that uh, neck restraints ought to be prohibited unless there's an extreme circumstance that you're fighting for your life or what have you, but that, that doesn't happen very often, believe me, but it ought to be just outright uh, prohibited. That's one. The other one that's in that uh, category that uh, DeRay mentioned was to uh, um, shooting at cars. But one of the, uh, the most important, important ones is duty to intervene. That is, I mean, you saw it graphically illustrated in, in Minneapolis where you had officers uh, one of one of whom had his uh, you know knee on the neck and and back and the others you know kind of even though they knew this man was suffering even though they knew at one point he had no pulse I mean at what point in time do you intervene I mean a duty to intervene and unfortunately uh, you know even though it's in the policy in Minneapolis they didn't do it I mean you got to hold people accountable policies have to be more than words they have to translate into actual behavior on the street. As far as, as, as departments, you know, fighting use of force, I mean, use of force continuum has been around as long as I've been around. I did 47 years in, in, in policing. Uh, is there have been restrictions on use of force, firing in crowds. I mean, there have been restrictions. Now, do they go far enough? Should we constantly evaluate and add? Yeah, we should. Because the one thing that should be in there, and I noticed that when I read the, um, uh, the eight can't wait, Sanctity of life, a policy that clearly states the, the sanctity of life first and foremost before anything else. It's almost like the Hippocratic oath, do no harm. That ought to be uh, the same oath that we take in policing. You know, we resolve these issues, but our first responsibility is to do no harm. Make it, don't make it worse than it already is and avoid anything that could cause serious injury or death at uh, all costs. You know, Chief Ramsey, you brought up accountability. Can we talk about that for a, a yeah. hot second? What are the barriers that have prevented progress in the, in the realm of accountability? 
Some of it's poor supervision, to be honest with you. When you look at the structure of policing, and some of it has to do with, with our, even our promotional process. The only way to make additional money in, in policing is either through your tenure, would you get step increases if in some situations, or through the promotional process. So you have some people who have really no interest in being a supervisor, yet they take a competitive exam, they get promoted, yet but they, they aren't leaders, they aren't supervisors, that that's not really what they do. We have to hold people accountable. That starts with tight, first line supervision, middle management supervision. Uh, you know, I, I hear the phrase, you know, just a few bad apples. And, and I firmly believe it's not the majority of police officers. I, I know that's the case, but the good apples have to have to take care of the bad ones. And we can't keep using that as an excuse, because one is too many. We are judged not based on what we do in our individual cities. And I think Minneapolis and these other places have shown that. Anything that happens anywhere in today's world with cable TV, video, it affects every single department. It, it, the profession of policing is, is, is under uh, fire right now. Uh, and and I, it's a great opportunity for change. And I'm really optimistic that you'll get some substantive change this time. But accountability is key, but it has to be from the bottom up and from the top down. And what I think you know, too, she, I, yeah, go ahead, Duray. Go ahead. Ed, is that um, is that what is so interesting too? Is we spend a lot of years trying to figure out structurally what the problems are. And you think about in California, there's a law that says that any investigation of an officer that lasts more than a year can never result in discipline, regardless of the outcome. That's sort of wild, right? You think about in Oregon, uh, the law literally says that an officer can use deadly force if they think you just committed a felony, or if they think you're about to commit a felony, that is sort of wild. So, you know, Ramsey talked about uh, the problem with arbitrators. There's some police departments where 70% of the people fired get rehired. And we work with cities as they go through the, arbit the, the negotiation process. And some of them don't imagine, they can't imagine a world where like an arbitrator is not the final person. And it's like, we can imagine a million worlds because in Ramsey, you've read some of these arbitration decisions. These decisions are not like the most airtight rationales you've ever heard. You know, sometimes you read them and you're like, how did you reach that conclusion? But but we're stuck with arbitrators being the final person. Uh, so I think that this is a moment that we can actually peel back all these layers that people didn't even know existed before. I want to I, I I just add one thing. Real, sure, real sure, Chief Ramsey. Cities signed off on every one of these collective bargaining agreements. And so you talk about accountability, it's at the government level as well, because a lot of the things that are in these contracts were signed off on by city officials. Now, some were the result of, of arbitration as well, but many of them were signed off on by cities. I want to get I, I want to get to that because that gets to a restructuring issue in, in the role of government. But I, real quickly, I need you to, to define a, a, a term because this gets back to accountability. What is qualified immunity? Well, I mean, I'm not okay. a, I'm not a lawyer, so I probably won't be giving you an exact uh, definition of it. But my understanding is that if an officer is acting under color of law within within the guidelines uh, that govern their behavior. And if an incident occurs, they're covered, um, uh, you know, uh, and, and won't be sued individually. The city can be sued, but they won't be Got sued it. as an individual. That's my understanding of, of how it works. Okay. Chief Ramsey, I have a, a question for you from a reader. Um, it is from Sally, Sally Hook. I hope I'm pronouncing your, your last name correctly, Sally, in Oklahoma. And she asks, what would restructuring policing look like from the ground up? I mean, some of the things we've talked about already, first of all, you have to reimagine uh, policing. Police were built on a model very similar to the military because the first people in America that really started creating police forces were basically all ex-military people. So you wind up with officers, sergeants, lieutenants, captains, and so forth. So you got this chain of command, so many layers uh, in between. We need to rethink that uh, because, again, um, it, 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 there are situations where, where uh, you know, too many layers, it, ju it just impedes communication in terms of policy and everything else that you want to get done. But the other thing is what police should actually be doing. And, and Duran and I were talking about that a little earlier. I mean, we fill in all the gaps that are there in government. I mean, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, holidays, you name it, police are out on the street. You can't say the same for these other agencies. They're not. And a lot of what we deal with happens, you know, after five o'clock uh, in the afternoon when a lot of people you know, go home. Uh, that's when a lot of stuff happens. And so, you know, having 
others that have the expertise deal with some of these issues. And I don't think we can totally remove ourselves, but we don't have to be lead on it. We can just have a secondary role if there's a safety issue. But they need to be able to step up. That's going to require funding. Now, not all that funding can come from police. It needs to come from other places as well, because to sustain it long term, it's going to require a regular funding stream, whether you're talking about school counselors, school psychologists, health care, uh, mental health workers, substance abuse uh, 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 counselors, people that work with the homeless. I mean, we need to think about that and then focus the police on air er in areas where their 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 power of arrest, their their uh, uh, being a sworn member of the department actually makes a difference. Actually matters. Uh, that's where they need to be. So um, I know it's a long answer, but mm -hmm. I think we need to rethink about the role and responsibilities uh, of police. They've gotten too broad. Deray, let's talk about the, the, the metrics for success. Um, should arrests be the metric for success in policing, or should something else be a metric for success? Well, you know, I'm, this is a fascinating question. So first, we need to measure the amount of force being used in police departments and killings, and that has to go down. What's interesting when we look at the numbers is that uh, killings in cities is actually, is actually decreasing in a statistically significant way, but it's being offset by increases in rural and suburban communities. So uh, one of my worries, honestly, Kpar, about the coverage of the protest today is that it's very LA, it's very New York, and the reality is that those places are experiencing historic decreases in this particular problem. It is not in Albuquerque where a, a couple years ago, one in three homicides in the city of Albuquerque was actually committed by a police officer. I don't see cameras in Phoenix where one in five homicides was actually committed by a police officer. I, st I don't even see people back in St. Louis that has the, had the highest rate of police violence from 2013 to 2019, right? Omaha. So there are these places where the problem is actually wild. It is huge. It is unending, unyielding. And the media is like, let's focus on LA and New York. And like that, I think is, I think that that is a, that is malfeasance. I, you know, that is, that only exacerbates the problem. So that's like one bucket of it. But the second is, and Ramsey knows this, is that when, when you say the police solved the crime, solved is not at all what the public thinks it is. The public is like, they got the, they got the bad guy, got a conviction. Solved really means that the police made at least one arrest. I don't even know what that means. I don't know what, I don't know what I can use that to inform me as a citizen. I don't, know how that, so that such, such soft data doesn't justify the gazillions of dollars that goes into them. If anything, the police department's own metrics tell me we should be putting the money somewhere else. Uh, do, uh, well, on, on that note, Chief, Chief Ramsey, <laughs> I guess DeRay, um, that's actually a, a, an excellent last point there. Chief Ramsey, to your mind, having run two major metropolitan de police departments, if you were a chief of police today, what would you say should be the measure, the metric of success for a police you know, department? Uh, when, we, um, when I co-chaired President's Task Force, President Obama's Task Force on 21st Century Policing, one of the things we discussed, and we brought this to the attention of Ron Davis, who then was the uh, director of the um, COPS office, uh, Community Oriented Policing Services, part of DOJ, um, that annually there should be a report and we entitled it the state of policing in the United States. And not only would it deal with statistics, you can't totally get away from statistics, but it would include surveys, citizen surveys, satisfaction of police service. I mean, it would be a broad range of things to find out just how effective are police in doing their jobs. One report was published, the administration changed and of course, uh, that along with our report, quite frankly, got put on a shelf or in a waste can, whatever, but it, 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 it stopped. And so I think there's got to be other, other ways of doing it. But I would call on the media, though, to be involved in that and to look at it differently, because at the end of the year, the only thing they look at is a measure of success or failure for a department in a city is the homicide numbers. That's it. If your homicides are up, that's the story. You can be you can be up in homicides, down and everything else, doing a great job community policing. The only story, the only headline is going to be around murder. The part one crime that's committed with the least amount of frequency. I'm not saying it's not important, 
But what I'm saying is we all need to take a broader look at police effectiveness, not just deal with just the numbers for one particular category of crime. And as far as closures go, I, I worked in homicide a long time. If you have multiple offenders, you have one in custody, uh, the case is still open until all the offenders are in custody, uh, but it's like cleared, closed, which means it's cleared, you have somebody in custody, uh, it's, uh, but there are other uh, outstanding warrants and other persons that you want to take into custody uh, in that particular case. But we need to be clear in terms of our communication with the public. And if you've got a homicide or any serious crime, we need to be in touch with the victim or the victim's family on a regular basis so they understand where the status of an investigation. Last question for both of you, DeRay, I will, I will go to you first on this. We've seen a lot of people out in the streets demonstrating, protesting in cities and towns all over the country, and if you want to expand it, all over the world. And there's a, a feeling out there of optimism that we're at an, an inflection point and things are going to change. How optimistic are you for the chances in this area for the chances of police reform as you've been advocating for? Yeah, I think that this will be a matter of uh, can we organize to get outcomes? So when we look at 2014 to today, remember that the police killed more people from the first protest to now, that like none of us nailed the structural changes. What we know today is all the things that don't work, right? Body cameras, implicit bias, media training, I mean, media, uh, I mean, mental health training. And uh, the number of black officers does matter, but not to get to over 35% of the department and community policing, not wins, right? So we got to figure out what are the structural things that actually matter. And that's what I'm interested in this moment. You know, it's why it is not very popular. The A can't wait. Some people inside the movement think it's not radical, which is why they have been attacking it at every step of the way. And what I'd say is that there's no one step to zero, right? There's no one strategy. You think about the end of enslavement. There wasn't one strategy that got us there. It's a host of strategies working in concert with each other. So a recognition that today we can reduce the power of the police, we can restrict uh, their use of force. We also need to move some money away. There are also, uh, you know, opportunities to make sure that experts do what experts do. And when you peel it back, you realize you don't really need the police for much at all. You know, like, and we, if we don't invest in social services in a demonstrable way, then like we will always be back at this place again. So I think there is a moment do I think people have courage to do it? Uh, you know, I think I think Tom will tell. Have I seen political mm -hmm. leaders know better, still say the wrong things and do the wrong things? Yes. So we'll see. Chief Ramsey, as the, the former co-chair of President Obama's task force in 21st century policing, given what you're seeing happening around the country right now, are you optimistic about the chances for real reform for some of the things that you you came up that came up with being adopted more broadly? Well, I am optimistic, and I think history showed us that one event can lead to uh, change beyond anyone's imagination uh, at the time. And I'll give you one very good example, and that is in 1955, a woman named Rosa Parks decided one day she wasn't going to give up her seat on a bus uh, to a white man. That led to the Montgomery uh, a bus boyc boycott, the civil rights movement, and several decades later, led to me having the opportunity to become police chief in our nation's capital and later Philadelphia. And so these things have a ripple effect. This could be that moment as well, that some youngster right now, they may be either watching this or, or whatever they may be doing, it will impact their ability to be able to, to uh, seek any, any opportunity they want anywhere they want because of the sacrifices made by people today, the movement that has begun with this. So things can start with one movement. But just in one final thought here, just to push back a little bit on something DeRay said, there is still real violent crime taking place in many of our neighborhoods. And so we need to be able to balance and, and uh, you know, we don't need police. You, you still have to investigate homicides. You still got to find a person responsible for that. And when we don't want a vigilantes, we, we, I mean, there are only certain things that community folks ought to be able to do. But what, 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 what we need is good constitutional policing, not just policing. And I think if we, can, if we can do that, if we can get police officers to see policing through the eyes of those being policed and develop that empathy, understand where they're coming from, then I think we start to rebuild trust uh, among the people that we serve.
good constitutional policing. That's a, a, a great phrase to end on. DeRay McKesson, Chief Charles Ramsey, thank you both very much for, for being here. This is a conversation we're going to keep having as the months and days go on. Um, that is all the time we have for right now in this Washington Post Live. Coming up today at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, my colleague David Ignatius will interview Salesforce CEO Mark Benioff. We'll continue our conversations about race in America tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. with Obama senior advisor Valerie Jarrett. Then on Monday at 2.30 p.m., the head of the, the, the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, Congresswoman Karen Bass of California. And next Thursday, we'll have Minneapolis Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. So we look forward to seeing you then. For more information about all upcoming programs, head to WashingtonPostLive.com. I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for The Washington Post. Thank you very much for tuning in.